and welcome to In Focus South Asia. I'm Meher Sher, filling in for Ajaz Heather today. In today's program, we will be discussing Pakistan's special representative on Afghanistan, Mohammad Sadiq's visit to Iran to meet with top Iranian officials and the start of the Biden administration's indirect diplomacy with Iran on the nuclear deal. Pakistan's envoy Mohammad Sadiq is discussing several mutual regional issues, including the latest developments in Afghanistan on the peace process. Both Iran and Pakistan share a border with Afghanistan and are directly impacted by the instability in Afghanistan. Earlier, the envoy met with Iranian Foreign Minister Javad Zarif and other top officials. Both sides agreed that Daesh poses an immense threat to regional peace and security. Will Pakistan and Iran work towards a unified approach on Afghanistan? Representatives from Pakistan and Iran will be attending a Russian-mediated conference on the Afghan peace process in Moscow on the 18th of this month. Coming to the Iran nuclear deal, the White House National Security Advisor stated that the U.S. has started indirect diplomacy with Iran through European nations. How effective will it be? Can Pakistan play a role in the indirect diplomacy? And can this lead to direct diplomacy over the Iran nuclear deal or the JCPOA? Is detente on the horizon for the two nations? We will be analyzing both of these developments and more with our experts in the program today. We are being joined by our guests for this topic, Asif Durrani. He's the former ambassador of Pakistan to Iran, and he is joining us from Islamabad, as well as Rahimullah Yousafzai, who is a Pakistani journalist and political and security analyst, joining us from Peshawar. Uh, Asif, thank you so much for joining us. Asif, sharing the same regional and security concerns, what do you think the Pakistani envoy and Iranian officials agreed uh, upon in regards to the Afghan peace process? Well, I think uh, there is a commonality of interest with regard to Afghanistan. Both are immediate neighbors. Both have suffered due to Afghan crisis over the past four decades. Both have had millions of refugees still. The refugees are there in Pakistan, close to 3 million. Same in Iran, almost uh, 1.7 million refugees in Iran. And uh, then uh, there were some problems with regard to Afghanistan, especially during initial years of Taliban and, in fact, uh, till the, the fall of uh, Taliban, uh, there was a problem between Pakistan and uh, Iran because of the perceptions of Taliban. So, but now uh, things have changed after the 9-11 and more specifically when the United States declared Iran as an axis of evil. So, in that respect, they, since they already had the bad blood and then it uh, aggravated and after the attack of the Americans in Iraq, in fact, uh, Iran got much more strategic space, uh, not only in uh, Iraq, but uh, in um, uh, most of the, of the Arab uh, states, modern Arab states, including Syria and Lebanon. So now Israelis are uh, concerned that Iran has created a Shia crescent uh, meant to uh, encircle Israel. In that respect, so that is uh, you know apart from our discussion. But with regard to Afghanistan, there are many common factors. Both countries they can cooperate, and uh, one major aspect of that cooperation should also be not only the refugees, but also uh, Afghanistan is uh, a narco state for all practical purposes, and Iran and Pakistan are the transit countries. So uh, they, already there is some cooperation going on between the two countries. So in that respect, uh, there are, there's tremendous scope of cooperation between them, yes. Right. Now coming over to you, Rila, the Russian-led conference on Afghanistan will be taking place in Moscow in about three days. Do you think both Pakistan and Iran will have a unified stance on the subject? I think that uh, this will be another opportunity for Pakistan and Iran, along with other countries, to talk about Afghanistan, to coordinate their policies. Uh, as Asif Dharani Saab said, there are some common factors, uh, you know, unlike the past, when Pakistan and Iran differed uh, because of Afghanistan, because of Pakistan's closeness to Taliban and Iranian opposition to Taliban and support for the so-called Northern Alliance. Yeah, so I was saying that, you know, uh, there is some commonality now 
in their policy regarding Afghanistan. Uh, both are concerned uh, about uh, the U.S. Uh, you know attitude because uh, the U.S. Uh, peace agreement with Taliban, uh, you know that uh, has to be implemented. But the U.S. is now uh, maybe wanting to change those timelines uh, to withdraw from Afghanistan by May 1st. So I think that, you know, I remember the Iranian foreign minister, Jawad Zarif, uh, he was critical of this peace agreement in Doha between the U.S. and Taliban. And he said that, uh, you know, this is in the U.S. interest. Uh, he also said that Taliban was still labeled as terrorists by the Iranian government. That also actually provoked the Taliban to criticize the Iranian position. So I think there are still some issues which need to be resolved. But in terms of the state policy of Pakistan and Iran, there is much more in common uh, than the past. And I think, uh, you know, Russia also has almost the same views regarding Afghanistan. So this will be a meeting of countries uh, which have almost similar views and who have a stake in Afghanistan, which is peaceful and stable. Right. Uh, so Rila just said, Asif, that Russia, uh, Pakistan and Iran are coordinated and pretty much on the same page towards Afghanistan. What is your view on that? And also, will a unified approach between Iran and Pakistan on Afghanistan be more beneficial, perhaps, in terms of reaching an outcome during the talks in Moscow? I think there is a formidable change in the region with regard to Afghanistan and uh, attitude towards Taliban. In fact, Taliban of uh, 2021 are not the Taliban of uh, prior uh, pre-9-11 situation. Then the Taliban were quite reclusive uh, group of people who were ruling Afghanistan. But now Taliban, they have uh, launched uh, their outreach program all over the neighborhood, immediate neighborhood, and, and which is why, and then their presence in Doha itself speaks a lot, of course, with the American consent. So in that respect, uh, when you talk about commonality or uh, cooperation between Iran and Pakistan, actually, I think uh, uh, Taliban have become more savvy and they have outreach to their neighbors. Earlier, this was not the case, and uh, earlier they were, they were facing a, a lot of uh, opposition, especially from uh, Iran and Russia. And there was a nexus between Iran, Russia, and India uh, during those days when Taliban were ruling. So, but now it is a different uh, ball game. It is now Pakistan, Iran, and Russia, as well as China, are almost on the same page. So there's a you know sea change as far as situation uh, around Afghanistan's immediate neighborhood is concerned. Yes. Right, and to build on that now, uh, Mala, you just heard what Asif said. What do you think the regional actors will learn from the Doha peace talks in terms of how the stalemate persisted? And more importantly, uh, how will the Moscow conference be more effective as compared to the previous talks that have taken place? You know, Russia has hosted uh, Afghanistan conferences in the past as well, uh, in 2019 and also 2018. Uh, so they want to be, you know, uh, involved. Uh, this is a sea change from the past because, you know, the Soviet Union had invaded Afghanistan and installed a government of its choice. Uh, led by Barbara Carmel and then Dr. Najibullah. Uh, so that uh, was the past. But, uh, you know, I think uh, that invasion and the suffering of the Afghan people and the defeat of the Soviet Union, these are now uh, almost forgotten. And I think there's a new chapter uh, in the relationship between Afghanistan and Russia. And now Russia is a peacemaker. Earlier it was uh, an invader. So I think, uh, accordingly, the Russians have changed their policy. Uh, that's why they are hosting these kind of conferences. I think Russia was the first country which hosted a conference in which Taliban leaders were invited 
and they were made to sit face to face with the Afghan opposition, uh, you know, uh, and that was, I think, something of an achievement at that time. So now this conference is, uh, you know, it's not even a conference, I think. Uh, it's a meeting of uh, just a few countries, uh, China, Russia, Iran, Pakistan, and also uh, they have invited the Afghan government and Taliban. So this will be, I think, uh, you know, they can talk, uh, you know, very closely and they can discuss the future. But I think the Russian initiative uh, of holding this conference on the 18th of March has been overtaken by events because of this new U.S. proposals for peace in Afghanistan. So those uh, proposals, like hosting an inter-Afghan conference in Istanbul, Turkey, or asking the U.S., uh, the U.N., uh, to uh, sponsor a conference of the foreign minister of some regional countries. Right. Uh, you know, I think the, these initiatives uh, are more important, I think, than the Russian initiative. And Russia also will be involved in these conferences, uh, which is being hosted by the U.N., so, but I think that you know every effort for making peace in Afghanistan should be welcomed. That's why the Russian initiative is important in that sense. Right, and Ro, uh, you brought me to my next question. Uh, Asif, if another round of talks uh, will be held in Turkey in April, um, and the Turkish Foreign Minister Mevlut Cavusoglu has said that these talks are meant to complement the Qatar process, uh, not to replace them. And like Qatar, now Turkey also has a, a good record uh, when it comes to a positive mediation record. How strong of a role uh, could Turkey play in terms of reaching a settlement, something we haven't seen with previous talks? Well, Turkey has uh, had relationship with the uh, different Afghan factions, especially those books. Uh, Rashid Dostum was taking uh, refuge in, Afghanistan, uh, in Turkey for many, many years. And uh, Turkey has also invested a lot in, uh, especially northern Afghanistan, in the education and health sector. So uh, Turkey has been playing a role. Uh, but uh, uh, I think uh, Doha would uh, still remain a strong base for the Taliban because Taliban are based there. Why United States has chosen Turkey for this intra-Afghan dialogue to be shifted from Doha to uh, Ankara mm -hmm. uh, is uh, not very clear. But at the same time, one can uh, hazard a guess that uh, given the tensions between Turkey and the United States after the 2016 Bosch coup attempt in Turkey, the relationship between uh, United States and Turkey were quite cool. Uh, and uh, that's why the, the uh, there were also many criticisms exchanged by, by the two countries. So now I think the United States uh, wants to mend fences, and I think this is an opportunity to request to Turkey to play a, a role, a facilitator's role for hosting of the intra one dialogue in Ankara. So that could be the reason. Otherwise, uh, the talks were there, but the main issue is that the stalemate persists. And when stalemate persists, uh, so in that case, I, I don't think that Ashraf Ghani government, or for that matter, Taliban, they are going to give up so soon uh, or so easily uh, their positions. And those are right now quite, uh, I mean, diametrically opposed uh, as far as their positions are concerned, whatever we know of from the open sources, yes. Right, Asif. So just to clarify, uh, what you're saying is you, you don't think that upcoming talks will be fruitful in terms of bringing about an outcome or a settlement between the parties in Afghanistan? No, I'm not saying that. Uh, any talks, any initiative which is taken actually, in fact, uh, helps in clarifying positions. And then that's how uh, 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 such talks are held. And uh, there could be many sessions. So in that respect, I'm not saying I neither I'm pessimistic, but at the same time, I'll have to be cautious enough uh, not to make those guesses which ultimately 
uh, were proved wrong. Uh, and especially when we uh, talk about situation in Afghanistan, which is quite fluid, and uh, there's a history behind it. And during the past four decades, uh, these are one factions. They have been coming closer, but at the same time, for different reasons or for different pretexts, they have uh, fallen apart. So, uh, in that respect, uncertainty is because of the mercurial nature of different Afghan factions. Yes. Right. Uh, Rahimullah, what are your thoughts on that? What's your take on that? Do you think that um, Ashraf Ghani and the other parties in Afghanistan will remain solid on their positions? Or do you think that the upcoming talks, uh, especially particularly the one in Turkey, do you think that that will provide more room perhaps to reach for a settlement? I think there have been a number of visits uh, between the two countries. Uh, you know, there are certain issues which have been highlighted. Uh, one of the issues is that, you know, Iran wants Pakistan to complete uh, the Iran-Pakistan gas pipeline project. Iranians say they have uh, completed uh, the, uh, the, the pipeline on their side uh, up to the border with Pakistan, but Pakistan has not been able to do it primarily because of the U.S. sanctions. And I think, uh, you know, um, the Indian uh, involvement, you know, uh, this uh, Indian spy, Kulbushan Yadav, according to Pakistani authorities, was based in Chabahar. And he was operating from Iranian territory, coming to Balochistan and, uh, you know, uh, assisting the Baloch militants. And also, uh, you know, being involved in acts of terrorism elsewhere in Pakistan. So that, uh, you know, is uh, Iran had actually denied this, but that is the Pakistani version of events. So that also needs to be uh, investigated. And uh, Iran has to ensure that its territory will not be used against Pakistan. Right. Uh, now, uh, moving on to our next uh, subtopic on Iran, uh, we want to discuss U.S. and Iran ties. So, Asif, coming over to you, uh, the U.S. and Iran have been back and forth uh, on the JCPOA and have made statements against each other, stating that the other party isn't uh, complying with or upholding the deal. But no direct dialogue or action has been initiated. Why do you think that is? Well, uh, when it comes to uh, Iran nuclear deal uh, called JCPOA, I think United States uh, is the guilty party because it withdrew from uh, the agreement. And it is the United States which will have to revert to, uh, to the deal. So in that context, I think Iran cannot be accused uh, primarily because Iran was in uh, full uh, compliance of the provisions of the nuclear deal and IAEA, which is the watchdog, and uh, to, uh, to see all uh, those actions which Iran is supposed to take, has in fact been endorsing that Iran has been in full compliance of the conditions laid down in the JCPOA. So therefore, the United States uh, will have to, otherwise they uh, by, uh, uh, the United States is not in a position to dictate the terms, at least uh, on that, that count. So this is very important. And secondly, the, just uh, since I'm on it, uh, Raimullah Saab has mentioned uh, about the, 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 the cross-border movement. Uh, yes. One thing is clear that uh, Pakistan has taken adequate measures. In fact, uh, a southern uh, command of the FC led by a major general was established specifically on Iran's request, and it is now manned by almost 12,000 personnel along the Iranian border. For the first time in uh, history, this has taken place. It has brought down drastically those movements, especially the suspicious people, whether it is uh, Jash Adil or Jandullah, or for that matter here, our people. But there's one problem. Uh, that problem is uh, because of the easement rights uh, allowed on both sides of the, uh, of the, of the border uh, amongst the, the divided tribes. So they travel. So they travel 60 kilometers on each side of the border with the permission of the uh, deputy commissioner or on their side, Iranian side, the Marzbans. 
they 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 issue the permit. So that has been the case, and that has been causing problems. Kalbushan uh, Yadav, in fact, hood, hoodwinked Iranian authorities as well, because he was running a jewelry shop in Jabahar, but at the same time he was running this whole show. Um, on gas pipeline, let me tell you that because uh, uh, of the funding problems, uh, of course, Americans' uh, pressure was very much there. They even pressurized Pakistan not to sign uh, the agreement, but Pakistan went ahead in 2013. But uh, on this count, uh, uh, an uh, investment problem over there, and it, it requires more than $2 billion investment to lay the pipeline on the Pakistani side. Iran has completed, but they are still 200 kilometers short of uh, uh, reaching to uh, the border. And initially, Iran had promised to invest $500 million for the initiation of the pipeline, but they did not come forward. So there are many other reasons. Right. But for that, I think uh, no one can be uh, um, blamed wholly for the delay of the project, but at the same time, the major problem is the investment, the money, which has to be invested in that. Right, uh, uh, Asif. Going back to the JCPOA, uh, Rahimullah, how do you view the indirect diplomacy currently being channeled uh, through European countries? Is this step a positive indication? I think uh, we have a new U.S. president, uh, Joseph Biden, and uh, he is a team player, unlike uh, Trump, uh, who was raising the slogan of America first. And in a way, he isolated the U.S., uh, pulled out of many international agreements, and also pulled out of this deal with Iran. Uh, but, you know, the Europeans, you know, the other countries who were involved in this deal, uh, they were not happy about it. And that's why, you know, Iran was asking these countries that they should put their foot down and they should, uh, you know, not support the U.S. policy. I think now uh, that Biden is the president, uh, you know, certain policies of Trump are being rolled back. Uh, you know, for example, for the first time, the U.S. has uh, invited Iran, uh, you know, to, 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 to take part in this deliberation on the Afghan peace process. That is something, uh, you know, remarkable, something new, because Trump was not willing. Uh, to even, uh, you know, mention Iran. Iran has a very important role to play in the Afghan peace process. Also, I think, uh, you know, the Americans want to negotiate uh, with Iran, but Iran has put up a very justified condition, and that is if sanctions should be uh, withdrawn, then we can negotiate, because uh, until there are these sanctions, uh, Iran, you know, believes that it is unfair. And so I think there are, uh, you know, some positive indications. Right. And I, I believe that uh, the Europeans uh, would become more involved now uh, and led by the U.S. And that will, I think, augur well for better U.S.-Iranian relations, and which will lead, I think, to peace in the region, that is very important. Right, that's a valid point you've made, Allah. And now, because we're running uh, short on time, I would like to get Asif's uh, thoughts on this as well. Asif, do you see Pakistan perhaps playing uh, a role in the indirect diplomacy that the United States has initiated, being that Pakistan is a neighboring country uh, for Iran and also a U.S. ally? Well, it is possible because uh, Pakistan still uh, looks after uh, Iranian uh, interests in Washington uh, and uh, their diplomatic bag uh, goes through Pakistan Embassy, Tehran, and it goes to Washington. Uh, there are always uh, possibilities, so that cannot be ruled out. And um, I think in the past also, we have been uh, conveying uh, some, some kind of uh, uh, core diplomacy. It was there. So uh, for uh, being a neighbor, uh, I think Pakistan, Iran, uh, they may have uh, differences in perceptions, but uh, luckily there are no disputes between Pakistan and Iran. And both countries have uh, stood by each other on, in, uh, during difficult times. So I think uh, there's a possibility, but provided the two parties, they, they, they ask Pakistan 
uh, to play the role, yes. Thank you, Asif Durrani and Rahimullah Yousafzai for joining us. Uh, we will be taking a short break, and when we return, we will be discussing the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Bangladesh on the 26th of March. Stay with us. Welcome back. And now on to our second and final topic of the day. Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi is set to visit Dhaka for the Golden Jubilee Independence Day celebrations in Bangladesh on March 26th. The Bangladesh government has planned to hold large celebrations to mark their 50th Independence Day. In India, the festivities to celebrate Bangladesh's independence will be held countrywide to celebrate what Prime Minister Modi terms a, quote, golden victory. A few years ago, Prime Minister Modi admitted to India's role in the breakup of Pakistan. India was an aggressor in the 1971 East Pakistan War and actively financed and trained the Mukti Bani. On Sunday, we saw protesters demonstrate against the Indian Premier's visit in Dhaka. Bangladesh and India have shared close bilateral ties for decades. However, several key issues persist when it comes to water, trade and even COVID vaccines, to name a few. The nexus between India and Bangladesh exists despite these issues due to their common anti-Pakistan sentiment. Bangladeshi people, however, feel that India has not been supportive of their self-sovereignty over the years. This has led to public disapproval of the Indian-sponsored government of Sheikh Hasina. Many Bangladeshi political leaders also oppose the closeness with India due to the rise of Hindutva ideology and anti-Muslim violence under the BJP. On the other hand, Pakistan has been working for years on the diplomatic front to improve relations with Bangladesh. What is Prime Minister Narendra Modi's strategy in Bangladesh? Will he be able to mend the mistrust between Bangladesh and India, or will the public discontent in Bangladesh lead the people to challenge Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina's government? To analyze Prime Minister Narendra Modi's visit to Bangladesh, we are being joined by uh, Brigadier Imran Malik, retired. He is a defense and geopolitical analyst. He is joining us from Lahore. Uh, in addition, we are also being joined by Rafi Zaman Siddiqui, who is a former ambassador. He's a former counselor uh, of the High Commission of Pakistan to Dhaka and the current advisor to United Marine Agency. He is joining us from Karachi. Uh, Brigadier Imran, uh, what is Modi's objective uh, for this visit? Is India just flexing its muscles and uh, showing its might in the region? Or is there a strategic objective to the visit? Uh, <clears throat> first of all, my gratitude for having me in your program. Uh, I think uh, uh, Prime Minister Modi's visit to uh, Bangladesh has uh, multifarious objectives. Uh, and particularly at this time when they are uh, celebrating their uh, golden jubilee of independence. And uh, bilaterally, if we see India and Bangladesh have had reasonably good relations throughout. However, of late, uh, the China factor has come into play. And uh, Bangladesh appears to be straining at the reins as it is and trying to break free of uh, India's hegemonic control over it and is trying now to uh, seek other uh, areas of succor and help as well. And China and its uh, Belt and Road Initiative is playing a very important role. So, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, one feels that uh, the economic juggernaut that the BRI is, and as it has entered uh, the South Asian region, India now finds itself almost um, literally isolated. Pakistan, Nepal, Bangladesh, Sri Lanka, Maldives, Bhutan even, all seem to be uh, moving away or out of uh, uh, India's orbit, and they are now uh, being um, uh, included uh, in the uh, in the Chinese sphere of influence. Now, if we come uh, and concentrate on the Indo-Bangladesh relationship, I think um, uh, Prime Minister Modi uh, is making a definite effort to make sure that Bangladesh does not slip out of its sphere of influence and does not go uh, into China's uh, uh, embrace because, one, it will not um, only um, mean a, a, a failure of their policy vis-a-vis -vis Bangladesh, for whom they helped uh, uh, to get independence, but would also strengthen China's uh, uh, presence in the South Asian region. 
So one, uh, the, these are the two major uh, objectives I feel uh, that Prime Minister Modi has uh, while he visits uh, Bangladesh. He wants to reiterate uh, uh, the Indian-Bangladesh uh, relationship. He will definitely remind them of uh, India's role in Bangladesh's uh, independence and uh, uh, particularly the role played by the Indian Army and the armed forces, rather. And um, as they say, he will make a bid for uh, his pound of flesh. And that pound of flesh, in my opinion, would be um, in terms of uh, Indian, um, uh, they will expect Bangladesh to toe the Indian line, not only in foreign policy and trade relations, but also uh, uh, not only in, uh, within the South Asian region, but beyond as well. So India does not want to lose Bangladesh as it has apparently lost Sri Lanka and, uh, and uh, Nepal uh, to, the, to the Chinese uh, economic juggernaut and probably would make a, a, a reasonable, um, or if not a desperate, but a very reasonable attempt to keep uh, Bangladesh within its own ambit. Right. So, and now uh, turning the discussion over to you, uh, Rafi, we saw anti-India protests in Dhaka uh, over the Indian Premier's uh, visit uh, to Bangladesh. How do you think the people of Bangladesh are viewing this visit? It's, uh, thank you very much, Mayor, for having me over. Uh, firstly, let me um, endorse what uh, Brigadier Saab has said. But, um, and uh, my point of view in the matter is that Bangladesh is like a paradox. You know, there are people who do not want any kind of subjugation from India. But at the same time, there is a lot of bonhomie between the two countries at the government level. But when it trickles down to the public level, it really disappears to quite an extent. Having served in Bangladesh uh, for twice, once during uh, Khalid Azir's regime and then more recently as High Commissioner, uh, when Prime Minister uh, Sheikh Hasina was very much there, uh, this, you know, um, situation regarding uh, Modi's visit. But firstly, it is more symbolic because it, he's coming. Uh, this is this would be his first visit after COVID. And uh, they right. are kind of trying to, uh, you know, they are trying to be very, very close to Bangladesh through, you know, vaccine diplomacy, through very various economic, uh, you know, um, uh, economic uh, challenges that, that Bangladesh has. They are trying to help them out with that. But at the same time, there is a feeling amongst the people of Bangladesh that Modi is not the right guy. And especially, you know, what happened just last year about uh, the uh, CAA and uh, NRC, which led to many Bangladeshis, uh, you know, people, Bengalis living in uh, West Bengal, they became extremely annoyed. And it, in fact, annoyed the Bangladeshi government to an extent when the foreign minister cancelled his visit and when the foreign secretary rushed to Dhaka to kind of mend fences. He was not really given a very um, grand reception that they always expect. So Bangladeshi, Bangladeshis are quite perturbed over what has been happening during Modi's regime, and they have not shied away in expressing it. Like yesterday, there was a demonstration in Dhaka, and I'm given to understand that it is probably expanding to other cities as well. So Modi's arrival in Dhaka from the government's point of view, like, you know, they, they have invited other uh, leaders of the uh, other countries like Nepal, Bhutan, uh, Sri Lanka, and so on and so forth. But the people in general are not really happy with Modi. And I understand that since he is coming to, uh, you know, ce celebrate the, Bangladesh, the ba Bangladesh's 50th Golden Jubilee celebration, they are kind of keeping up low profile right so, so you said that basically the bangladeshi people are publicly disapproving of uh, modi's visit to bangladesh and don't think that he's the right man for the for their job uh brigadier imran turning over to you uh india was the aggressor uh during the 1971 war inciting separatism in east pakistan which eventually led to the breakup of Pakistan. Uh, in recent years, we have seen that mistrust has grown between Bangladesh and India on several issues, water being uh, the most crucial one. Uh, does this mistrust originate from India's role during the war? I think yes. <clears throat> I think um, what the Bengalis or, or what the Bangladeshis for, uh, must realize is 
that whatever India did in the 1971 war was clearly not out of love for the uh, Bengalis living in the, in the then East Pakistan. It was more, uh, I think, because uh, of the Indian uh, ambition and drive and penchant to negate uh, the very idea of Pakistan and furthermore to negate the two nation theory. I think the creation of Bangladesh was perhaps uh, a consequence uh, of that uh, Indian desire to somehow uh, avenge the humiliations of centuries, as uh, Mrs. Indira Gandhi said uh, sometime uh, early in 1972. So that uh, uh, issue uh, will remain uh, in the background. However, there are many issues uh, of contention uh, between India and Bangladesh. And uh, the primary ones, if we can talk about, are uh, first of all, is the water issue. Uh, the Indians have built uh, the Farakad barrage and they are transferring water uh, into the Hooghly River. That means that they are taking away water that should have normally and legally gone down to the lower riparian, that is um, Bangladesh. Secondly, they have uh, issues with the Tista River uh, water flows. Yes. So, uh, but they are, as a, as a matter of fact, uh, talking on these um, issues and trying to resolve them. Then uh, India has uh, issues uh, with um, uh, terrorist activities, which is uh, which, according to the Indians, originates from Bangladesh and um, ends up in uh, India. And they name um, uh, Harkutul uh, Jihad al-Islami, uh, some uh, uh, Bangladeshi group. Uh, they make uh, they make that group responsible for these activities. Then India has an interest in getting transit to its northeast eastern states because the Siliguri uh, corridor which is just about uh, 27 um, kilometers wide, is probably not uh, safe enough for them anymore, particularly with the, uh, with the issues that the Indians now have uh, with the Chinese on the line of actual control. Right. And they would now want right. to have another safe and a secure approach uh, to the, north, the northeastern states. And then the normal border skirmishes and uh, drug smuggling and those issues, they continue. So these are the issues that normally uh, uh, that are normal between two countries, and I think, and they are uh, being uh, addressed by both the countries. However, as the, uh, uh, the ambassador uh, just said, and I agree with it 100 percent, the current issues uh, have really uh, brought the Indo-Bangladesh relations uh, to a testing uh, position. Uh, India's Hindutva policy has created uh, a great deal of um, uh, what do you say, acrimony in, in the entire region. All South Asian states uh, have been a victim of that, and more so Bangladesh now. And in particular, uh, the people of Bengali origin who are in Assam and who have been deprived of their uh, nationality and their citizenship, that has hurt the Bengalis, uh, the Bangladeshis, uh, yeah, even more. Right. And, uh, right. Uh, right. So, um, the, the turning over to you, uh, uh, apologies, Brigadier, because we're short on time, uh, just to extend the discussion over to uh, Rafi. Rafi, 26 March um, has been termed by uh, Prime Minister Narendra Modi a few years back as a golden victory, um, and India and Bangladesh are celebrating it as that. Uh, while in Pakistan, uh, 23rd March, just three days before, um, is celebrated as Pakistan Resolution Day. How will this impact uh, the 23rd March celebrations this year, the fact that Prime Minister Narendra Modi uh, is celebrating this, uh, quote, uh, golden victory in Bangladesh. It's, it's very interesting to see, you know, Modi in, uh, in Bangladesh this time. But uh, I, I think, you know, regarding the celebrations of 23rd, uh, 26th March in Dhaka is, of course, a very important event, symbolically also, because it is the 50th year of the um, liberations, the so-called liberation, uh, which they are celebrating this year with great pomp and show. And Modi is going to be there for two days. He's also going to visit Tungipara, the the, uh, the place where Mujib's remains are buried. And then he's also going to have uh, visit three other places and two temples. And uh, the, the important point here is that the Bangladeshi government has, of course, you invited him, and they are all um, uh, very happy about it. But the, gen the general public, as I said earlier, as I mentioned earlier, is, of course, has reservations about it. The Indian government is trying its level best 
to kind of, you know, because what has happened recently uh, because of this uh, agreement uh, the last year, which they had uh, 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 announced, uh, the CAA and, and, and national uh, registration card thing has quite, you know, disturbed the relations between the two countries. This 26 March is basically to celebrate, you know, as I said, the golden to be celebrate uh, golden uh, to be celebrations of their independence. So this, of course, has has a great impact between the two countries. Right. And uh, uh, this is what you know the Bangladeshis are happy about, but they are they have not really come out so openly. Um, as yesterday, there was a small uh, demonstration in Dhaka against Modi's visit. But with, of course, we have been kept aside because of obvious reasons. Uh, Pakistan, uh, being a part of the region, has been kept away, and Bangladeshis are kind of focusing more on BIMSTEC. SARC has been become redundant. It is like, you know, it is a dead horse. It needs a lot yes. of whipping, and I don't think so, that it is going to gallop um, any, any more because of uh, the tensions between our two countries like Pakistan and India. Yes. So Bangladeshis are now kind of focusing more on BIMSTEC than SARC. And they, do, they have no interest in, in its revival because they don't want Pakistan to be involved in this region. So in my view, this 26 March is basically an important day for them, an important day because it's, you know, they are celebrating their liberation. And of course, this is also important because uh, last year they could not um, celebrate the centenary celebrations of Sheikh Mujib. So they right. are, it is like coinciding this year. So all these uh, heads of state and government would be visiting, uh, you know, Tungipara and they will also be taken to the museum which used to be the sheikh mujib's house so all these programs are also have been also been included to give uh, you know importance to their leader uh, by all these heads of the state and governments right uh, brigadier and just a final question um, in recent years pakistan has been trying to work on improving ties with bangladesh in your view what is the future of pakistan bangladesh ties and is it possible uh, during the indian sponsored government of sheikh hasina to even make uh, progress on ties between the two countries I think it is extremely important for Pakistan to improve its uh, relations with Bangladesh. And I think um, uh, we have a common friend now uh, who can play a, a very important role in doing that. You see, uh, the mere fact that China has made, or, or its BRI has made uh, ingresses into Pakistan and into Bangladesh, it creates a commonality uh, between the two countries. And uh, secondly, uh, uh, the, uh, the Chinese uh, ingress into Bangladesh is re weaning it away uh, from Indian pressure and Indian influence. So it is about the right time, I would say, that Pakistan and Bangladesh should make attempts to improve their relations. And uh, I would not be surprised if uh, uh, either of them or both of them use the good offices of the Chinese uh, to create that uh, ge geopolitical environment for both these countries to come close to one another. And the more that uh, Bangladesh moves away from India, the easier it will be for Pakistan and Bangladesh uh, to come um, uh, to, get, to get together. One last comment, if I may. Uh, uh, you just spoke of the, the importance of 26th March and uh, 23rd March. I could not help notice the irony of it. 23rd March marks the demand for a whole Pakistan. 26th March marks the dismemberment of Pakistan. Right. And I think right. for us, it's quite heartbreaking. Right, of course. Uh, just briefly, uh, Rafi, uh, I want your opinion on this as well. Uh, do you think, like Brigadier Imran said, do you think China can play a pivotal role now uh, between Bangladesh and Pakistan to perhaps uh, better the ties between the two nations, Im improve the ties between the two nations, rather? <sighs> I think it is rather Herculean task for China. And normally Chinese do not interfere in, you know, third countries' affairs. I, in my view, I think it is it is not all that, um, you know, it's not so, you know, possible that Chinese would like to come and play the role with regard to bringing rapprochement between Bangladesh and uh, Pakistan. As long as Awami League is there, this uh, Sheikh Hasina's government is there, I honestly speaking, don't see much happening on this front. 
You know, there have been uh, reports that uh, Prime Minister Sheikh Hasina had spoken to Imran Khan, and in fact, our Prime Minister has also uh, made phone calls, and they met on the sidelines of OIC in Saudi Arabia sometime, but nothing really moved from there. I think um, it's quite a difficult, it's, it's a very, very, you know, challenging uh, task to bring our two countries together as long as um, Awami League's government is at the helm of affairs. And I don't think so that even China would like to play any role in that. We'll have to wrap up the discussion there on that note. Uh, thank you, Brigadier Imran Malik, retired, and uh, former Ambassador Rafiul Zaman Siddiqui. Keep watching In Focus South Asia.